Thank you, Sharon Rose Giddens, Master of Ceremonies. Dr. Brathwaite, Mrs. Brathwaite, Reverend Dr. Edwards, our district president, Reverend Clifton Morris, our superintendent from Bethel, and Mrs. Morris, Reverend Pearson Blackman, our superintendent of, from the Ebenezer Circuit, and Mrs. Blackman, Methodist ministers, preachers, stewards, and officers, ministers and representatives of other denominations. Ladies and gentlemen, a blessed night to you all. It is indeed my honor to be called to introduce Dr. Chelston Brathwaite, a very distinguished Barbadian, who in a few moments will deliver the seventh annual lecture in memory of the right excellent Sarah Ann Gill, national heroine of Barbados, whose courageous fight against the tyranny and injustices of her day has helped us to make a day like today, a night like tonight, so pleasant a reality for every one of us. Dr. Charleston Whitley de Costa Braffitt is an internationally recognized and acclaimed authority on agriculture and also on agricultural development. Ten years ago, this illustrious son of the soil became the recipient of the Companion of Honor of Barbados, receiving our second highest national award. As a young boy, Dr. Bradford attended St. Matthew's Elementary School and the Modern High School in Barbados, and I gather from those who knew him from that time that he always had a passion for agriculture. And uh, he has lived with that passion. He went on to Trinidad, where he gained his BSc, honors in agricultural science, um, and then he was also student of the year in 1965. He is still a very much um, a farmer, you know. People who know him tells me that any morning you will find him in his back garden tending to his plants. And he has told me very boastfully one day that he grows the best lettuce in Barbados. Uh, we are going to challenge him to that. Well, after uh, Trinidad, he went on to do his Master of Science degree in, and his doctorate in plant pathology from Cornell University in the United States of America. He holds a diploma in agricultural development with distinction from the University of London. He has completed courses in executive management at the Central American School of Management and pursued courses in leadership for senior executives at Harvard Business School. He was a lecturer and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Agriculture of the University of the West Indies from 1971 until 1981, when he joined the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, we call it ICA, I-I-C-A, an arm of the Organization of American States, and he joined as a regional agricultural specialist for the Caribbean. That's when he joined. Two decades later, he became the Director General for the Institute in 2001, and he served in that capacity until 2010. Dr. Brathwaite is the first and only person from the English-speaking Caribbean to have served as Director General of that now 70-year-old organization based in San Jose, Costa Rica. 
The Institute provides technical and policy advice for 34 countries of the OAS in food and agricultural development. Credentials very impressive, but I do not think that I am able to introduce the man through his credentials alone. Bear with me as I try to tell you something more about Charleston Baffett, the man who grew up in Barbados with certainly no gold spoon in his mouth, but a man who grew to understand how to harmonize his passion with a purpose. And his purpose has always been to help people up, not to help them down. And he did it, he continues to do it through agriculture. As a matter of fact, I call him Barbados's own apostle of agriculture. Because he loves to talk about it, you cannot get him to stop talking about it. And he will argue that that is what God intended for us because the first thing he gave us was a garden. And it had everything in it. As I was saying, he became the first black man at the helm of this vital hemispheric organization in 2001. It was not easy at the top. And remember, at this stage, I want to give you some insight into the man, not just his credentials. I was fortunate to have a peep at his autobiography which is to be published shortly. And he says, as soon as he gets it out of the claws of the editors. Uh, and in that autobiography, he reflects on his first years as director general. He writes, I was aware that my greatest challenge in the job as director general was to demonstrate every day that we as a people possess the dignity, the strength of character, the moral qualities, and the technical and administrative skills to lead an international agency. I was aware that all the smiles and expressions of goodwill were not genuine. There were those who thought my mission to reform the Institute were impossible, and those who hoped for my failure. I did not dwell on those problems, but I began to implement the vision that I had presented to the member countries. Let's fast forward a few years, maybe a decade or so, now to a meeting of the Inter-American Board of Agriculture, the IABA, which sees after the ICA, and this is following the completion of Dr. Brathwaite's second and final term as the head honcho of the organization. There are 33 delegates meeting, 33 delegates from the Americas, and they acknowledged his role in improving agriculture and rural life in the Americas, and conferred on him the title Director Emeritus of the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. The IABA underscored, quote, the importance of the Braffitt administration given its many contributions to the improvement of agriculture and rural life in the Americas, calling particular attention to the effective, efficient, and transparent manner in which he conducted the affairs of the Institute. The countries commended him on a job well done and expressed appreciation for the concern, the integrity, the intelligence with which he had fulfilled the responsibilities conferred on him by member states, and for his contributions to repositioning agriculture in the entire hemisphere. The members of the IABA also stated their thanks for the integrity, that word again, creativity, and humanity with which Brathwaite had directed the Institute. 
it was particularly noted that Dr. Braffitt had made transparency and accountability hallmarks of his administration. I have learned that many of those of his detractors who railed against his appointment back in 2001 then became his staunchest supporters. Tonight, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored indeed to have tonight's lecture delivered by a son of the soil, recognized not only for his academic brilliance and his technical skills, but also for his integrity of character, for his use of transparency and accountability to help others, and to see his vision, and to see his vision, for them to see his vision, and then work along with him to make that vision a reality. There's another little thing I want to tell you. Uh, Dr. Braffitt tells me, well, I should tell you that he's a very happy man, wife, beautiful wife, and five children. And he tells me that when he looks back on the course of his life, I'm, I'm saying this deliberately because when news got around that Dr. Braffitt was going to deliver this lecture, one of the first questions asked me is, is he a Christian? He tells me that when he looks back on the course of his life, he can only acknowledge that it was God who guided him to where he is now. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it has been my delight to introduce Dr. Braffitt, and I want to invite you now to help me to welcome him to the podium to deliver the seventh Sarah Ann Gill Memorial Lecture, Social Justice and the Role of the Church in Agricultural Development. Let me begin this evening by thanking God for the honor to be here this evening. Members of the judiciary, Madam Sharon Rose Gittins, Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Michael King, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture. Dr. Cuthbert Edwards, President of the South Caribbean District of the Methodist Church and Superintendent of James Street. Spice Down Circuit in Barbados and Mrs. Edwards. Reverend Clifton Morris, Superintendent of Bethel Circuit and Mrs. Morris. Reverend Pearson Blackman, Superintendent of Ebenezer Circuit, and Mrs. Blackman. Methodist ministers, preachers, stewards, and officers. Ministers and representatives of other denominations. My wife, Rosanna. My sisters, Corrine and Ursula. My brother, Trevor. Mr. Eddie Edgehill and Mrs. Edgehill, distinguished guests, friends, family, loved ones, good night. It's good to be here. I am indeed honored to join the six distinguished presenters who in the past give this lecture in honor of the right Sarah Ann Gill. Let me begin by saying that I'm very pleased for this invitation 
an opportunity to present to you some thoughts and some ideas about agriculture in the world, agriculture in Barbados, and where we are, where we stand, and where we're going. I've chosen a rather complex topic, Sarah Ann Gill, social justice, the church, and agricultural development in Barbados. I will seek to outline the role of the right excellent Sarah Ann Gill in the preservation of the Methodist Church in Barbados, the global challenges of our time, the need for a new vision for the agricultural sector in our country, the role the church can play in that vision, and I will also say a few words about development of Barbados as agricultural development cannot be divorced from the economic and social development of our country. I will present the view that agriculture is much more than primary production and much more than sugarcane production, that an improved level of food security is fundamental to the growth and diversification of the Barbadian economy, that the linkages of the agricultural sector to health, nutrition, tourism, and the manufacturing, if emphasized and developed, can redound to the benefit of the society and the people, that modernization of the sector is a prerequisite for poverty alleviation and the reduction of the cost of food and the high food import bill, that the production of locally, that local food will contribute to reduction of the cost of health care and contribute to employment creation and the creation of business enterprises, and that preservation of the agricultural sector is in the long-term strategic interests of our country, given the world food situation. But before I begin, let me thank Mr. Harry Mayers for that wonderful introduction. After he presented that introduction, I didn't think I had very much more to say. <laughs> because he said it all, but he had a privileged position of reading some of my autobiography. And I appreciate your comments, and uh, you know, if I, one day I had to go for political office, you'll be my manager. <laughs> Let us begin with a little bit of history. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, had published as early as 1774 his opposition to the slave trade in the British colonies. Methodism and the missionaries were therefore regarded as agents of the anti-slavery society established by the abolitionists in 1787. The abolition of the slave trade by Great Britain in 1807 signaled the beginning of the end of what was until then a profitable and inexhaustible source of free labor required by the West Indian sugar planters. Reverend William Shrewsbury was appointed to Barbados in 1818 in succession to Reverend Moses Reiner. And he combined his conversion of slaves with his outspoken condemnation of the immorality of some members of the privileged landowner and mercantile class. He was uncompromising in his preaching because the guilty privilege were set in bad examples which were damaging the mission's work. When Shrewsbury's preaching caused female converts to Methodism, mainly the free colors, to withdraw their favors from the upper middle class, the upper class mercantile class, Methodism and all that it stood for became marked for destruction. This is from a work entitled National Heroine of Barbados, Sarah Ann Gill, published by the Methodist Church in 1998. It was during this struggle to save the Methodist Church in Barbados, which promoted the teachings that all people are children of God and are therefore brothers and sisters under his fatherhood, that the right, excellent Sarah Ann Gill emerged a heroine. Determined, courageous, and deeply religious, she fought against the establishment of the day to preserve what she saw as a need for social justice and equality for all. In one of her letters, 
written on the 16th of May, 1825, she wrote, and I quote, I shall be in prison, but glory be to God, none of those things move me. While these promotions are without, there is a settled peace within, which I know the world can neither give nor take away. End of quote. Sarah Ann Gill stood up to the establishment of the day to save the Methodist Church in Barbados and was prepared to die for what she believed. What were her beliefs? The rights of the people to freedom of worship, the right to pursue their religion, and the right to social justice. She demonstrated the leadership qualities of courage, determination, and dedication to a cause. In the days of Sarah Ann Gill, our world was a place of inequality, a place of injustice, a place where there were, was exploitation of the working class, a world where poverty was rampant and social injustice the norm. Sarah Ann Gill, like all great leaders, saw a new world. Nelson Mandela saw a new world. John F. Kennedy saw a new world. Martin Luther King saw a new world. It is the ability to visualize a new world and to fight for the elements that will create that world that distinguishes leaders from great leaders. As Robert Kennedy said, and I quote, there are those who look at things as they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. The greatest lesson that is obvious and fundamental from the life of Sarah Ann Gill is that in this life, we must stand for something. We should serve a cause that is greater than our own self-interest. The Reverend Martin Luther King summarized this concept when he wrote, I quote, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. How many of us today have moved from the confines of our own personal and mental space to embrace the concerns of humanity? Are we concerned about poverty? Are we concerned about obesity? Are we concerned about our country? Are we pre prepared to live a life of service? And in speaking of the need to live a life of service, I again quote the Reverend Martin Luther King when he said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Sarah Ann Gill had such a heart, one full of grace and a soul of love. Sarah Ann Gill knew that freedom has always been an expensive thing History is fit testimony to the fact that freedom is rarely gained without sacrifice and self-denial because freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. May the late Reverend Right Excellent Sarah Ann Gill rest in peace. The church and its leaders have played an important role in world history. From the abolition of slavery to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. What then is the role of the church today? Where does the church stand with respect to the greatest challenges of our time? Poverty, hunger, and economic exploitation. Is the church today taking its rightful place in championing the cause for social and economic justice? Barbados and the world has changed dramatically 
since the days of Sarah and Gill. Slavery has been abolished, and religious freedom exists in Barbados and indeed in many parts of the world. But ladies and gentlemen, the world of 2013 is not a paradise. Today, the world faces the worst social and economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. In fact, the world faces an economic crisis, a financial crisis, an unemployment crisis, a crisis, a food crisis, a health crisis, a crisis of confidence in leadership and institutions. There are those who also believe that we face a moral crisis. Never before in the history of the world have we had so many crises all at the same time. Today we stand at a most important moment in history. The major economic powers of the world are still in recession. The G8 countries no longer dominate global consumption or global capital formation. Developing economies will grow at rates that will double those of the developed world. The population of developed countries will represent a smaller and declining proportion of the world's population. And the major growth in population in the future will occur in the cities of the developing world. The Middle East and North Africa are still in political turmoil. Today, there's evidence of increases in the incidence of global warming and climate change, increases in the incidence of chronic non-communicable diseases, increases in the cost of energy and in the production of sustainable energy from agricultural resources, increases in the prices of basic commodities and the cost of food, increases in the de deterioration of natural resources and accelerated loss of biodiversity increasing levels of poverty, both in the developed and in the developing world, and a narrowing of the divide between the developed and the developing economies. Petroleum resources dwindle as demand for energy soars. Unending conflicts, financial crises, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, cyclones, and mudslides have killed thousands. Pollinating bees are vanishing and polar bears are becoming extinct. Rising oceans, thinning forests are evidence of a change in our climate, where the dry season has become the wet season and the wet season is wetter than ever. <laughs> Al Gore, winner of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, stated the following in his acceptance speech in Norway. I quote, so today we have dumped another 70 million tons of global warming pollution into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet as if it were an open sewer. And tomorrow we will dump a slightly larger amount, with the cumulative concentrations now trapping more and more heat from the sun. In the last few months, it has been harder and harder to misinterpret the signs that our world is spinning out of kilter. Major cities in North and South America, Asia and Australia are nearly out of water due to massive droughts and melting glaciers. Desperate farmers are losing their livelihood. People in the frozen Arctic on low-lying Pacific islands are planning evacuations of places they have long called home. Unprecedented wildfires have forced half a million people from their homes in one country and caused a national emergency that almost brought down the government in another. Climate refugees have migrated into areas already inhabited by people with different cultures, religions, and traditions, increasing the potential for conflict. Stronger storms in the Pacific and the Atlantic have threatened whole cities. Millions have been displaced by massive flooding in South Asia, Mexico, and 18 countries in Africa. As temperature extremes have increased, tens of thousands have lost their lives. 
We are recklessly burning and clearing our forests and driving more and more species into extinction. The very web of life on which we depend is being ripped and frayed. End of quote. In 2001, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change revealed evidence showing that the Earth's climate is changing faster than previously thought. The scientific evidence on global warming points to a rise in temperature of 1.4 to 6 degrees over the next century, higher than earlier predictions. The panel believes that an increase of this magnitude will result in rising sea levels and more frequent occurrence of extreme weather events, such as droughts, floods, and violent storms. Severe water stress in the arid and semi-arid land areas in South, Southern Africa, the Middle East, and Southern Europe exist. Decreased agricultural production in many tropical and subtropical countries, especially in Africa and Latin America, exists. Higher world food prices are projected as supplies fail to keep up with demand of a world population that is increasing at 78 million per year and will reach 9 billion in 2050. Major changes in productivity and the composition of critical ecosystems particularly coral reefs and forests, and tens of millions of people at risk from flooding and landslides, driven by projected increases in rainfall intensity and rising sea levels in coastal areas. In a recent address to the Organization of American States, the executive director of the World Food Program said, and I quote, soaring food prices threaten to exacerbate the circumstances of the already vulnerable, and to turn back the clock on the progress made by those individuals and families who have achieved food security. The silent tsunami traveling quietly around the globe hits those who are most vulnerable. It knows no borders. It has created, perhaps, the first globalized humanitarian crisis, adding another 130 million people to the ranks of the urgently hungry who were not there just one year ago. The global economic situation is presented vividly by Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate and chairman of the committee set up by the United Nations to reform the financial system in the wake of the global financial crisis. According to Stiglitz, it is important to recognize that what began as a crisis in the financial sector has now become an economic crisis. But it's not only economic crisis, it is also a social crisis. According to the International Labor Organization, the ILO, some 200 million workers, mostly in developing economies, will be pushed into poverty if rapid action is not taken to counter the impact of the crisis. Even in some advanced industrial countries, millions are faced with the threat of losing their homes, their jobs, and access to health care. Economic insecurity and anxiety are increasing among the elderly as much of their life savings disappear with the collapse of asset prices. The ILO estimated that unemployment in 2009 would have increased by some 30 million when compared to 2007. Given these global realities, it is clear to us that the Millennium Development Goal of reducing hunger and poverty in the world by 50% in 2015 will not be achieved in the majority of the countries. It is clear that we live in uncertain times with an uncertain future. Our reality was best summarized some years ago by Yogi Berra, who said, the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> Here in Barbados, our international image as presented in a report a few years ago is impressive successfully managed small economy, high human development index, leader in the Caribbean community, commitment to multilateralism and the rule of law, 
beacon of democracy and political stability, highly educated workforce, historic record of good leadership, a practical common sense approach to life, second oldest parliament, an increasing number of centenarians, a place of peace and tranquility, religious freedom. This impressive image, however, is now threatened by the global crises which we mentioned earlier. The global financial crisis which shook the world economy in 2008 continues to impact the social conditions of both small and large economies. In Barbados, a small economy of just 280,000 persons, the impact continues to be felt. In the report of the Country Assessment of Living Conditions commissioned by the Barbados government and the Caribbean Development Bank, researchers found that 19.3% of individuals and 15% of households are living below the poverty line. These results, when compared to the 1996 figures of 13.9% of individuals and 8.7% of households, clearly demonstrate that poverty is increasing in Barbados. The results note, the report notes that Barbados must look at the reduction of poverty within the context of its economic growth and its economic policies. In a recent press report, the governor of the Central Bank is reported to have indicated that for the first three months of 2013, the economy has contracted, I quote, the economy has contracted by 0.4%. The deficit has widened by 7.3%. Unemployment was up. Tourism arrivals were, have fallen, and major tax receipts were on the decline." End of quote. These reports suggest challenging times for our country, where we need to do all that we can to diversify our economy, protect our foreign reserves, and create an enabling environment for stability and future growth. When written in Chinese, the word crisis has two components. One component represents danger, and the other component represents opportunity. I believe that as Barbadians, with the determination, the fighting spirit, and the resolve of our national heroes, such as the right excellent Sarah Angel, we will grasp the opportunity and use these moments for creativity, innovation, new thinking, and the development of the vast entrepreneurial talent and the capacity of our people. But we must remember two things. The words of Charles C. Noble, who once said, you must have long-range goals to keep you from being frustrated by short-term failures. And let us all remember that hope is the single most important ingredient for energizing the human spirit. And one may ask, given these global and national realities, what should we do to secure our future? I'm no development economist, but I have a few thoughts which I would like to share with you this evening about what I think are some of the things that we could do in our country. Let me begin by saying the following. After visiting some 50 countries of the world and having had the opportunity to live in seven of them for more than one year, I know of no place where 280,000 people have progress as Barbados has in the last 45 years. With our only real resource being our people, we have done well. And as I reflected in the preparation of this lecture, I reflected on what are the success factors. And I came to the conclusion 
but in my opinion, there are five. My reflection led me to these five factors. Leadership, education, the ethos of the Barbadian people, national pride, and the religious foundation of our country. Time will not permit me to speak on all these factors today, but let me say that the church has played a pivotal role in all of these factors, but particularly in the areas of leadership, the area of education, and the promotion of that religious foundation of our country. The leadership of our forefathers and our national heroes, such as the right excellent Sarah Ann Gill, in political, economic, and religious and social affairs has been a critical factor in our success. I dare say, there's a leadership dimension in the Barbadian psyche, which I do not think has been documented. For in addition to good political leadership, Barbados has produced leaders in education, in religion, in science, in medicine, in agriculture, in law, in law enforcement, in business, in the arts, and in many other fields, not only for this country, but for the Caribbean and for the world. The vision for Barbados is set out in the National Strategic Plan 205 to 2025, provides for Barbados becoming a fully developed country by 2025. Prosperous, socially just, and globally competitive. And one may ask, as a nation, as a people, are we ready to achieve these noble goals? And as I reflected on the topic, I felt that there were six things and six dimensions that were critical. I believe that we must forge a new global relationships and partnerships, especially within CARICOM and the countries of Latin America and the BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. We must diversify our tourism industry to be more globally competitive, including ecotourism and community-based tourism. I believe we must support an aggressive policy on small business development and entrepreneurship. I believe we must become a center for excellence in solar technology. I believe we must continue to give priority to education, but we must promote an education based primarily on science, technology, and innovation. And I believe we must implement a new agricultural development agenda to feed the nation. Let me say a few words about these dimensions. I cannot overemphasize the need to promote a Caribbean economy and a single economic space as enshrined in the proposed Caribbean common market and economy. Every day, Small economies are becoming more and more marginalized by the global development partners, and so economic cooperation among CARICOM countries is vital for our survival. This is not the time to retreat from the integration process, but the time to promote the Caribbean single market and economy to obtain the ultimate goal of economic integration. I also think that the time has come to form an association of Caribbean people who recognize that we in this region, to paraphrase the Reverend Martin Luther King, are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. And we should work together to transform the jangling discord of our nations into a beautiful sympathy, symphony of brotherhood. Such an association would help to promote integration based on functional interests and enterprise rather than on politics. We probably need to revisit the work of the West Indian Commission 
and the proposed strategies for deepening the integration process. Our model of development cannot be based solely on the historical linkages with the United States, England, and Canada and their experiences. It is clear that more and more, we need to see the countries of the South and the East as sources of knowledge, experiences, and markets. One important region that is fertile for cooperation is Latin America, where some 500 million people live. The emerging economies of Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and Colombia have technologies, experiences, and markets that hold great potential for our products. But to exploit these markets, we need to become more entrepreneurial, more visionary, more multilingual. We should be teaching Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese in all our schools. Latin America was once considered a group of countries trapped in perpetual political conflict, mired in endless cycles of poverty, and governed by dictators. During my 20 years living and working in Latin America, I saw the region differently. I saw a region on the move, proud of their progress and history, and conscious of their role in the world. The spectacular reduction in poverty in countries such as Brazil and Chile, the transformation from dictatorship in Chile, Nicaragua, Peru, Paraguay, and others, the growing maturing of robust economies in Brazil, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, and Costa Rica are changes which we should not ignore. But there's another important reason to engage Latin America. I recently visited Miami, and those of you who have recently visited Miami would know that Spanish is the language of Miami. And while I was there, I saw an article in the newspaper which showed that one in every seven or 14% of the US population is now from Latin America. What does this mean? It has several implications. But one that I think is important for us, that the time may come when in order to export our products, to the United States of America, we may have to put the label in both Spanish and English. In addition, that Latino population is the fastest growing segment of the US population. We can also promote Barbados as an ideal destination for Latin American tourists, especially those from South America, from Southern Brazil, from Argentina, from Chile, from Uruguay and Paraguay, because their winter season coincides with our summer. And therefore, we can use this as an opportunity to continue to diversify our tourism industry. I think it's important to recognize that we have the potential to attract more Caribbean tourists to our country, as well as people from Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, India, China, and Japan. They too have money. And it is clear to me that tourists are no longer just looking for the sea and the sand, but for a unique experience. In this regard, ecotourism and agrotourism and rural and community development tourism and health and wellness tourism are critical elements of a new dimension. Our Harrison Cave should be promoted as one of the wonders of the world. And people should be encouraged to view this spectacular historic geological site, just as they are encouraged to visit the pyramids of Egypt and the Grand Canyon of the United States, the Galapagos Islands of Ecuador, the Eiffel Tower of Paris, and the Colosseum of Rome. And based on the experience of many countries today, small business development is critical for any economy. We must promote a culture of entrepreneurship as part of the building blocks for a new society. We must generate wealth and employment opportunities because they help to generate social equity. As more and more persons are able to participate in the economic activity of a country, 
the wealth of that country becomes more evenly distributed. A more equitable distribution of wealth is important for social peace and social stability. The Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM recently indicated that small and micro enterprises are central to the survival of Caribbean economies. They're seen as having the potential for creating those backward and forward linkages to reducing our foreign exchange expenditure, to utilize local raw materials, and enhance the economic and social conditions generally. These enterprises are further perceived to be flexible, able to respond rapidly to market conditions, and are excellent for generating employment. Small businesses generally are essential in the development of an economy. The youth of the 21st century must understand that in this new world in which we live today, the challenge will not be what job can I get, but what job can I create. The vision must not be who will employ me, but how many people can I employ? Mr. James Husbands, Managing Director of Solar Dynamics, said recently in a lecture here in Barbados, and I quote, since 1974, Barbados has engaged in the widespread popularization of solar technology. In 1980, the Barbados government provided a tax incentive to homeowners who install solar water heaters. In 2003, the United States Agency for International Development conduct, conducted a study here in Barbados. The study was undertaken by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And the highlight of the study showed that between 1974 and 2002, Barbados had saved 260 million Barbados dollars in energy costs as a result of the implementation of the solar technology system for hot water in the country. Fast forward, it calculated that the costs of the government incentive which was provided was only 13% of the national saving. I believe that given our success with solar water heaters, Barbados should establish a center for solar technology with the objective of making this country self-sufficient in renewable energy and developing industries based on solar technology to produce products for the domestic and the export market. But we must also continue to emphasize education. We must emphasize education because education is the building block for a great society. But we need to teach our students today that it is not only about going to school, but acquiring knowledge and skills that can help them to live a meaningful life. We need to teach entrepreneurship and business principles in all our schools. We need to establish business incubators in our country. The school of the 21st century, in my view, must be a place where students learn the skills to create their own employment. I therefore suggest a school where in the morning we teach academic subjects and in the afternoon we expose students to vocational skills in line with their interests. Our university, our university should become a center of innovation and a center for the incubation of enterprises that are critical for the development of the society. It is becoming clear that universities of the 21st century must not only graduate people, the university must cooperate with governments and the private sector to graduate enterprises. And we must emphasize that in China, India, Chile, Singapore, and the Nordic countries that have made a quantum leap in development in the last couple of years, the emphasis on technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation has been critical to their success. I recently had the opportunity to visit Brazil. Uh, we visited the University of Sao Paulo at Campinas in southern Brazil. And I was amazed to find that in addition to producing graduates, the university has a business incubator that has produced some 200 businesses 
which employ over 7,000 graduates. Therefore, therefore, education is important, but education is not enough. Education must result in the development of skills and innovation that can drive the creation of enterprises for self-employment and entrepreneurship in areas that are unique to our circumstances and our experience. I wish to show this slide, which I got in Brazil at the University of Campinas, because it shows very clearly the names of enterprises that have been developed by the university in an incubator which they developed. And this is a university, not an old university. The university was established actually in 1966. And these are the enterprises that have been developed by that university on the basis of technology and research done in the university. And those enterprises are now employing 7,609 people. 224 enterprises have been developed by that university. And therefore, the concept of a university, in my view, in the 21st century, is different from that of the 20th century. The 20th century university was a place for training and the supply of graduates, and that is still an important function. But in my view, the university must move beyond that and become a place of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship that generates the kind of enterprises that can employ the graduates that are produced. Let me now say a word about the world food situation. According to global statistics, the world is facing a hunger crisis unlike anything it has seen in more than 50 years. 925 million people are hungry. Every day, 16,000 people die of hunger-related causes, and there are 1.4 billion people in extreme poverty in 2005. According to the World Bank, the spike in global food prices in 2008, followed by the economic recession in 2009, has pushed about 150 million more people into poverty. And since 2008, since the 2008 food crisis, governments around the world have been expressing concern about food insecurity and vulnerability due to the lack of food. The food crisis in 2008 resulted in food riots in some 20 countries. Increases in world food prices, as has shown in this slide, were very obvious. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization reported a 45% increase in World Food Price Index during this period. Wheat prices increased by 130%. Soybean prices increased by 37%. Rice prices increased by 84%. Maize prices went up by 31%. In the past, we have seen increases in the prices of commodities. But rarely have, been, have we seen all the commodities increasing in price at the same time. The slide shows this trend. 2005, 2006, up to 2008, a dramatic increase in the price of grains in the world. And what has been the cause of all this? It is generally agreed that there are six basic factors that has driven the situation. Rising demand for food due to population growth and urbanization, especially in India and China. It's important to note that over the last 15 years, some 300 million people in China have joined the middle class. So it's not only population growth, it's also the changes in the demographics that has impacted the demand for food. Of course, you know China has about 1.3 billion people. Declining food production levels in part, in part due to the effect of climate change. The use of agricultural commodities for biofuel production, mainly corn in the United States and sugar in Brazil. Continued high price of oil. The increase in oil prices increases the cost of the inputs in agriculture and also the cost of transportation. And lack of investment in food and agricultural sector. 
In many countries, it was thought that we were okay, and therefore we needed no more investment, and consequently, we saw a significant decrease in the interest in agriculture. Some of the banks dismantled the agricultural divisions. It even happened in our own Caribbean Development Bank. But there was also speculation in commodity markets. In 2009, the G8 countries approved $20 billion for food security. First, the World Bank, now let me go back. Most countries recognizing this problem started to invest significant amounts of money in their agricultural sectors. In fact, many countries agreed to invest up to 10% of their national budgets in agriculture. And we have seen a dramatic change in many countries around the world in terms of agricultural output and food output. Whether it's in Ghana, or in Chile, or in Brazil, we have seen this dramatic investment in agriculture in the last five years, resulting in a significant increase in food production. But I should mention to you that here in Barbados, we put 1% of our budget into the agricultural sector. The World Bank concluded about 1%, about 1% of our budget. The World Bank concluded that agricultural development is fundamental for sustainable economic development and poverty reduction. And this is important because if we are to reduce poverty in the world, one of the most important things that has to happen is that people have to be fed because food is one of the basic requirements for life. And in some poor countries, people, poor people spend up to 70% of their income on food. Well, if you're spending 70% of your income on food and food prices increase, just think of your situation. Well, what is the agricultural outlook? The agricultural outlook is that the continued high price of oil, food prices will continue high and will continue to increase because that high price of oil will divert more agricultural commodities, especially corn and sugar, to biofuel production. And as the world demand for food increases due to higher incomes, population growth, and urbanization, world food prices will continue to increase. And climate change, which results in floods, droughts, and hurricanes, will continue to reduce available supplies. I give you one example of what's happening with China. Meat consumption in China has been increasing rapidly. More than a quarter of all the meat produced worldwide is now eaten in China. Of course, there are 1.35 billion people. In 1978, China meat consumption was one third of the US consumption of 24 million tons. But by 1992, China had overtaken the United States as the world leading meat consumer. And it has not looked back since. Now China annual meat consumption is 71 million tons, more than double that of the United States. With US meat consumption falling and China consumption increasing, the trajectories of these two countries are to an extent determining the shape of agriculture in the world. That slide on China has other implications. It's not only food, but several commodities are also being consumed by the rapidly growing Chinese economy. And China has recently been buying land in Africa and in Brazil. Why are they buying land? To secure their food security. When I was the Director General of ECO some years ago, we started to look at this concept of agriculture. And we had to do some research in order to clarify something that is often misunderstood. When we did our work, 
we came to the conclusion that the concept of agriculture was totally wrong. Agriculture consists of two systems, what we call a rural system and an agri-food system. The rural system is the production of commodities, crops, livestock, etc. And the agri-food system is all that has to do with processing, marketing, distribution, consumption, etc. It's important to make this distinction and clarify this point because so many people believe that when we speak of agriculture, we're only talking about primary production. We're not talking about primary production only. Agriculture is a series of value chains of interrelated economic activities which provide backward and forward linkages in an economy. And so, there are those who speak of milk as agriculture. But if we take that milk and convert it into cheese, they said that's manufacturing. <laughs> they say that the production of grapes is agriculture, but if you take those grapes and produce wine, that's manufacturing. As a result of that misconception, in my opinion, we have often underestimated the importance of the agricultural sector. It is not given its fair place in terms of its contribution to economic development. Because the processing, the market, and the distribution and consumption of food products is often put into industry or into manufacturing and not given to agriculture. And when we measure the contribution of agriculture to development, we often measure only the primary production. We do not measure the processed product. We do not measure the wine and the cheese and the processed products. That we don't measure the rum because we believe Production of sugar is agriculture, but the production of rum is manufactured. Well, if there's no sugar and there's no molasses, there's no rum. It has to come from somewhere. And so we did this study when I was uh, at ICA, and we showed that while in many countries, and all the countries, agriculture, when measured by using primary production is single digit percentages. When we measure the real contribution of agriculture, taking all the agro-processing into consideration, agriculture was three to seven times greater in its contribution to economic development. In this slide, the yellow bars are what are the traditional measures of agriculture's contribution to development or to economic activity, whereas the green bars show what happens when you measure using what we call social accounting matrices. For example, in Brazil, the official statistics say that agriculture is 4.6% of the economy. But when you measure all the linkages to agribusiness and processing, it is 26% of the economy. That difference makes a substantial change in how we view the sector and how we understand the sector and the contribution that it makes to development influences investment and the whole vision as to how we move it forward. And so we believe that it is important to understand this as we seek to understand an economy. For example, in the United States, only about 2% of the population is involved in primary production. But 25% of the population of that country is involved in the food and agribusiness industries. And I say to you that those companies which we know so well, such as the Burger King and the Kentucky and the Chefette, are only agro-industries. They depend on agriculture for their survival. Without agriculture, they have nothing to sell. If we understand that, we begin to understand the role of agriculture in an economy. 
because if you have no primary production, then you have no value added and no secondary production. We in the Caribbean have over the years been trapped in a colonial model, which we inherited, of course, which said, produce the primary product, and we will process it, and either sell it back to you or sell it to the rest of the world. And we will take the value added. I had a very interesting joke the other day. I saw some sachets of sugar being sold here in Barbados. My wife actually bought it, and I looked at it. The sachets of sugar are packed in Brooklyn. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a sister who used to live in Brooklyn in the United States of America on Putnam Avenue, and when I go there to look for her, I don't see any sugar cane. <laughs> the sugar was probably produced right here in the Caribbean. I don't know where. Shipped to Brooklyn. Packed very nicely in lovely label sachets and re-exported to us. Ladies and gentlemen, that model of development will take us nowhere. And today, countries, especially the developed countries, are beginning to see agriculture differently. The competitiveness of the agricultural sector cannot be based solely on the contribution of primary production. The competitiveness and importance of the agricultural sector must be seen in the context of the value added, the agro-industry, the processing, the agribusiness, etc. When the study was done in Jamaica, the study showed that while statistics show that in Jamaica, agricultural sector contributes 6%, to the economy, the study showed that the real figure was 12%. So in fact, the sector was contributing twice what it was, because of all the linkages, the input suppliers, the people who produce pesticides, fertilizers, tractors, irrigation water, finance for agriculture, they're all part of the industry. That's all part of what it's all about. It is not only the farmer producing the product, but all the inputs, and then the processing at the other end. Those are what we call the backward and the forward linkages of the sector to the economy. And today, there is a new concept, the bioeconomy. In recognition of this expanding role of the agricultural sector, most developed countries are not now talking about agriculture, they're talking about the bioeconomy. And what is the bioeconomy? The bioeconomy is a revolutionary concept where they are looking at sustainable production of products from biological sources. Whether it's food, energy, industrial products, once it's come, what is, why is it coming from biological sources, it is considered part of the bioeconomy. And the concept strengthens the relationship between agriculture and industry, making them an integral part of the same process. Because if you're producing milk and it's going into cheese, then that's all part of the bioeconomy. If you're producing grapes and it's going into wine, that's all part of the bioeconomy. And countries are now recognizing that there's significant benefits to be derived from using science and technology within the bioeconomy producing new varieties, producing genetically modified products, nanotechnology, bioinformatics, biotechnology, synthetic biology, genetic modification of living organisms, DNA cloning, are all new sciences that are coming up which are critical to the bioeconomy. And the new bioeconomy, therefore, 
involves the production of food, energy, pesticides, fertilizers, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and all those products that are derived from biological material. Now, when you take the bioeconomy into consideration in its totality, you begin to see that agriculture makes an even more significant contribution to an economy. And so today, there's a renewed emphasis on agriculture around the world. The sector is now viewed as a strategic sector for addressing the issues of economic growth, rural poverty, employment, and hunger. It is not surprising, therefore, to see that several countries have increased their investment in that sector. Now, what about Barbados? Since returning home about three years ago, I get the impression that there are people in our society, those in our society, who believe that we should abandon the agricultural sector and invest in a true service economy based on tourism and financial services. That we should create a tourist resort for the rich and famous, sell our land to the highest bidder for real estate and golf courses, and import our food from over and away. Ladies and gentlemen, a service economy that produces nothing to sell except sea and sand is not sustainable. We need our agricultural sector. We need our manufacturing sector working together in agro-industries to help drive our economy. I am aware that agriculture brings back memories of the past when sugar was king and Barbadians had to work hard on the plantations for miserly wages that barely kept them alive. I'm not here to speak about those days because we do not plan to return to those days. I'm here to say that around the world today, a food and agricultural sector that is modern and technology driven can play a critical role in economic development, mainly because food is a basic requirement for human existence. It will be a grave political, economic, social, and environmental mistake to abandon the agricultural sector of Barbados. A modern food and agricultural sector with its backward and forward linkages to the rest of the economy is an asset to any country as it contributes to food security, employment, social stability, and preservation of the environment. And being an island economy with limited land resources, it is of strategic importance to Barbados to increase its, to increase its preparedness for managing the effects of climate change, particularly those related to food shortages, higher food prices, as well as increase sea levels, which is predicted by the scientists. Barbados being a water scarce country, a major impact of climate change will be the impact on our water resources. And so we must implement water conservation techniques and methods, rainwater harvesting, drip irrigation methods, and do all that we can to conserve water. Why do we need a new vision for agriculture in this country? Let me give you a couple of reasons. The first, we need to maintain the beauty and the environmental health of this nation. Without a vibrant modern food and agricultural sector, one part of our lands will be converted into real estate, and the other part will be overtaken by bush which will harbor rats, snails, monkeys, and other pests. Leptospirosis, a disease of rats which affect human beings, is likely to become common. Cowich is likely to dominate the landscape, and this will be a menace both for the population and for the tourists. The landscape will become ugly, and Barbados could lose its reputation for being a green, beautiful country. If we wish to promote a green economy, that green economy cannot be about coverage 
and River Cambrian. It should be a green economy with lands producing food for our people. It should be a green economy that contributes to our economic development. From September 19th to 20th, 2011, a high-level meeting was held at the United Nations in New York to discuss the need for a global attack on the incidence of chronic non-communicable diseases. According to UN documents, cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and diabetes are responsible for 60% of, of all deaths in the world today. The conference concluded that one of the risk factors which contribute to the incidence of, this, of these diseases is unbalanced processed foods and ready-to-serve meals rich in trans fats, saturated fats, salt, and sugar. I want to repeat that because I think it's important. The conference concluded that one of the risk factors which contribute to the incidence of these diseases is unbalanced processed foods and ready-to-serve meals rich in trans fats, saturated fats, salts, and sugars. According to the conclusions of the meeting, chronic non-communicable diseases are a threat to development. These diseases contribute to low productivity, obesity, poverty, and human tragedy. According to one UN expert, if we are serious about tackling the rise of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, we need to make ambitious and binding commitments to tackle one of the root causes, the food we eat. According to the Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute over the last 25 years, we have seen notable changes in food consumption in this region. There was a time when there was serious malnutrition. Today, there's overconsumption of food, not necessarily the right foods, and evidence of obesity. Recently, there was a report that there are more people who are being killed by obesity than by malnutrition. In other words, there has been a shift in food consumption around the world that is having an impact on the rate at which we go. Meanwhile, dependence on imported food in our country has increased, and a diet typical of the developed world has supplanted the traditional diet. So today, people are no longer eating the almond bread, fruit, and sweet potato. They eat in other things. But recent reports and work carried out by Professor Hennis, head of the Chronic Research Unit here in Barbados, estimates that of 190,000 Barbadians, 20 years and over, 90,000 are overweight, 38,000 have hypertension, 19,000 are diabetic, and one person suffers a stroke every day. A recent report also indicates that the cost of health care in Barbados has moved from 167 million to 486 million, 150% increase. And a recent health summit the former Minister of Health, the Honorable Don Villanis, is reported to have said that a country report on Barbados showed that these diseases are estimated to account for 82% of all deaths. Nearly half of the population, 48.1%, are physically inactive, 69.7% are overweight, and 34.7% are obese. Of some concern is the fact that 76.6% of the females in Barbados are reported to be overweight. And as the population ages, the cost of medical care will result in dislocation of our financial balance sheets. We believe that now is the time to invest in wellness programs. A significant part of investing in wellness programs is ensuring that the population has access to fresh, wholesome food. 
An important part of that is an investment in agriculture. Advocating the consumption of traditional foods, such as yams, sweet potatoes, breadfruit, and edibles, which are high in dietary fiber and complex carbohydrates. Promoting the consumption of more fruits and vegetables. A survey found that only 20% of the Barbados population was consuming fruits and vegetables on a regular basis. We must eliminate the junk foods, which are high in trans fats and salts. We must do more research on the nutritional value of our foods. And we must implement training programs, especially in our schools, to demonstrate that our foods are good for us. I remember there's always a thought of advocating an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I say a banana a day keeps the doctor away. We must eat more fish because fish is reported to contain B vitamins and omega-3 fatty acids, which are reported to protect us from heart disease. There's another reason for a new vision. We need to generate jobs, entrepreneurship, and self-employment. The food and agricultural sector offers opportunities for entrepreneurship in production, marketing, processing, packaging, grading, labeling, etc. It is not only production. It is all that has to do with getting the food to the consumer. There are jobs all along the way. Packaging, processing, handling, all of that is important. When you import your food from abroad, you lose those jobs. There's a growing market for convenience foods and snack foods based on our products. But we need to emphasize agro-processing and agro-industry as part of that formula. And we need to promote linkages between tourism and agriculture. Consumption of local food validates our culinary heritage for the growing number of tourists who come to the Caribbean for a new gastronomic experience. And when they come here, we must ensure that they eat the local fare, the black belly lamb, the flying fish, and whatever else we have to offer so that we too can take advantage of the fact that a significant part of the tourism dollar is spent on food. If that food comes from abroad, you export the tourism dollar. If that food is local, the tourism dollar stays in Barbados. It's as simple as that. It is clear that food is an important part of the expenditure of tourists, and we must ensure that we capture as much of the tourist dollar as we can to contribute to our economy. There are those in our society who believe that tourists must have food from the countries of origin, from whence they came. I beg to differ. My experience, in, my experience indicate that visitors wish to try new foods as long as these are well presented, tasty, reasonably priced, and safe. But we also need to reduce the current food import bill. The food import bill is now, from the data we have in 2011, at $653 million. And if we look at what we're importing, that's a tendency. You see, just after independence, we were importing $32.8 million. And in 2008, it went up to $530 million. And if we look at the imports as a percentage of food, as a percentage of total imports, we get a picture like this. In 2000, food used to be 15% of imports. Today, it's 25%. And uh, 
When we look at similar data in many countries of the Caribbean, we looked at Trinidad and Tobago, for example. In Trinidad and Tobago, food is only 10% of their imports. In Barbados, it's 25%. And I must tell you, the bad news is that we have one of the highest per capita, per capita food import bills in the Caribbean, outside of the Bahamas. That $653 million used to be $359 million not so long ago. And it has jumped dramatically. Among the products imported, 24 million of fresh and frozen vegetables, 23 million of fruits, and surprisingly, $40.2 million of sugar. This is central bank information. And it looks sometimes as we do the analysis that we are producing sugar to obtain money to buy sugar. <laughs> and when we look at the seven top vegetables, this is the 653 million. You can see what we import. Processed foods, not good for us, 162 million. Juice concentrates, 106 million. Cereals, 93 million. Dairy, 53 million. Alcoholic beverages, 46 million. When I was looking at the analysis of the import bill, I recognized that the amount of money spent on alcoholic beverages had declined. I, I don't know whether that has anything to do with people that are drinking a little bit more of the local brew. Nuts oils and fats, beef, pork, lamb, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We only produce 10% of the amount of lamb we consume in this country. These are some of the vegetables we import. Things that we can grow here, sweet peppers, pumpkin, lettuce, cabbage, carrots, Onion and broccoli, $10 million. Four million of broccoli. When we looked at the average annual price movement for food, we saw a dramatic change. Between 2004 and 2011, the index for food prices increased from 106.65 to 177.38. A 66% increase in the retail price for food has had a dramatic impact on the cost of living in this country. And what about the sugar industry? An industry that we have been involved in for almost 300 years. We face a hostile market for this product, mainly because of change in economic conditions with respect to the major importers in Europe. And the WTO regulations in which all the subsidies and support systems have been removed. In 1957, this country produced 200,000 tons of sugar. This year, according to the information I have, we'll probably produce 18,000 tons. We're down to less than 10% of what we used to produce at peak. And the export earnings continue to decline. You can look and see that recently we have only been getting about $22 million from the export of sugar mainly because of the current situation. And we cannot compete. Brazil and Australia produce sugar at seven cents per pound. Guyana, most efficient producer in the region, produce sugar at 18 cents per pound. And Jamaica is about 40 cents per pound. And here in Barbados, we produce sugar 
a ton of sugar costs four thousand dollars to produce uh, we sell it for nine hundred and sixty dollars go to the next one yeah this slide demonstrates our reality every ton of sugar we produce according to this figure we lose three thousand dollars this situation is clearly not sustainable and it is clear that the production of bulk sugar for export traditional, traditional markets cannot continue. Recently, the Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable David Eswick, indicated that subject to cabinet approval, Barbados will stop the export of bulk sugar to Europe. That decision, in my view, represents a significant historic decision. It is as significant as any fundamental change that has taken place in our country. Because it represents, in my view, the end of a colonial relationship that only favor the colonial masters. And so, given all that I've said, it seemed to me that you would agree with me that there's need for significant reform of the agricultural business in our country. In early 2012, the Minister of Agriculture commissioned the preparation of a white paper on agriculture. We held a national consultation and we obtained the views of the farming community and the society at large. The document is now complete. The white paper prevents, presents the view that feeding the nation should be a priority of any government. And a number of options have been presented for consideration by the ministry. Not so long ago, a Barbadian family, the Edge Hills of Juke Plantation in St. Thomas, agreed to donate 28.3 acres of land to the university to develop a center for training and research in agriculture. The university has agreed to establish a center for food security and entrepreneurship. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the presence of Mr. and Mrs. Eddie Edgehill, who donated this land to you. Would Mr. and Mrs. Eddie Edgehill please stand and be recognized? Oh. Thank you. This remarkable gift to the university and by extension to the government and people of Barbados is a significant occurrence. We believe it represents the opportunity for change. The center which we propose to establish will act as a platform for education that helps to change attitudes and behavior about food and agriculture and their role in development. It will incorporate the latest and the best in agricultural technologies that is consistent with the concept of a green economy. It will also promote commercially viable enterprises using cutting edge technologies, produce professional farmers and agricultural professionals, and focus on generating wealth from enterprises based on food and agriculture, and the center must become self-sustaining in the medium term. 
There are four components of the center. It's a facility for training Barbadian farmers. We believe we need to train the farmers of the 21st century in new technologies and in ensuring that their farm is a business. A facility for conducting research on crop and livestock to promote sustainable systems. A facility for the promotion of entrepreneurship in agriculture based on local products which can be transformed into agribusiness opportunities and a facility which incorporates a commercial component that contributes to the long-term financial sustainability of the sector. But food security is a little like national security. Food is a prerequisite for social stability and economic development. A nation cannot survive without food. It is therefore in the interest of every government in the world to ensure that the food supply of the nation is adequate and available at reasonable prices. I believe that we here in Barbados should be conscious of the importance of our food supply. The ability to produce your own food increases your resilience to external shock and to food crises. And I would like to emphasize that should there be a major disaster in the world, God forbid, that there's a new terrorist attack or fallout from a nuclear accident or an international event that disrupts the shipment of food to Barbados, my question is, who will feed Barbados? This country was fed during the Second World War by policies that ensured that part of sugarcane lands were allocated to the production of food crops. We can do it again. We can feed Barbados by introducing new agricultural development policies, land, policy, land use policy, policy on food imports, and policy on predial larceny. We can do it again by the introduction of new technologies, including mechanization and food processing. We can feed Barbados again by new marketing arrangements which respond to the supermarket revolution. We can feed Barbados again by establishing a market information system to monitor supply and demand. We can feed this country again by improvements in the technical and managerial capacity of our farmers. We can feed the country again by new consumer thinking which values fresh locally produced food. We can feed the country again by investments in food processing, food storage, greenhouse technology, and food packaging facilities. We can feed the country again by a permanent marketing facility that supplies the elements for the marketing of local food. And we can feed this country again should there be an increased allocation of the budget to agriculture. With the resolve, the determination, and the commitment of the government and the people, the farmers of Barbados can do it again. There seemed to be a view in some circles that we are OK, and the comfortable in the society seem to believe that we can get our food from the USA and from England and Canada. But when you do that, you have no control over the price or the quality of imported food. If the food is full of pesticides and hormones and trans fats, you have no control. And the increasing use of genetically modified foods in markets around the world means that you should be vigilant about food quality. There are those who import food into our country and I suspect it's good business. But it is not in the long-term strategic interest of the country. 
And I would hope that those who are engaged in this business would seek to work with us to help produce food from local sources. Uh, what about the food supply for the next generation of Barbadians? Shall we put our lands into real estate and golf courses to the detriment of the next generation? I would like to see us preserve at least 30% of our land for food production in this country. The more land we put into concrete, the higher the runoff from the rains, the more soil erosion, the less water in our aquifers. Let us keep 30,000 acres of land for the development of food for the future of our country. There are several leaders today who believe that food security will become the defining focus of a new global environmental threat, and that food scarcity, rather than military aggression, will be the threat to world peace in the future. This is so because the drivers of the 2008 food crisis have not been resolved. And there is a potential for a clash between the expanded demand for food and the limits of our planet. In other words, the next global issue will probably be food insecurity. In my view, the church of the 21st century should not only be a religious institution, but a developmental institution as well. In the Holy Bible, in the book of James, it is written, and I quote, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but have no deeds? Can faith save you? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, if one says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. The word of the Lord. <laughs> According to Martin Luther King, any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and women and is not concerned about the economic conditions, about the economic conditions that strangle them and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry as dust religion. Sarah Ann Gill saw religion as an instrument to remove social injustice and dedicated her life to this worthy cause. Sarah Angel understood the importance of the church and religion in promoting social justice and equality in her time. I believe it is important that the church in our time should be concerned about economic injustice and the increasing levels of poverty in our society and must do all in its power to work not only for social justice but also for economic prosperity of its members. The church should not remain quiet when unscrupulous persons of our society take the savings of the poor and use them for their own opulent lifestyles and there seem to be no opportunity for social or economic justice. In 1973, the Caribbean Conference of Churches was established as an ecumenical development organization. And I have been informed that this organization did outstanding work in promoting development projects and entrepreneurship throughout the Caribbean region. That role of the church is needed today. A church which not only caters to the spiritual needs of the congregation, but also to the social, economic, and development needs of the people. The church today, as a leader in the communities across Barbados, need to support its members in becoming entrepreneurs and in so doing help our society in employment creation and the eradication of poverty and hunger. If there's one fundamental lesson we have learned from all the efforts to eradicate poverty around the world is that the poor do not wish handouts. The poor need an opportunity to earn a decent standard of living that is consistent with the maintenance of their dignity and their self-respect. 
Some time ago, the Methodist Church has an idea of developing a food garden mission that involves the promotion of food gardens by the church. Now is the time to revisit the concept and to implement the actions that were proposed in that mission. The church work in the communities it serves can contribute to the noble goal of a more food secure nation by evaluating the holdings of land and making land available for food production. The church should identify farmers and other resource persons in its membership and provide them with land to produce food. The church should educate its congregation about health, nutritional and economic benefits of consuming local food and encourage them to grow some of their own food. The church should promote healthy lifestyles among its members, including the need to exercise and engage in healthy eating habits. The church should encourage the members of the congregation to buy their food from local farmers and from local farms. The church should provide venture capital for farmers to buy equipment and other inputs for their farms, contribute to strengthening their communities of this fair land. And I hope that the church will pray to God for our leaders so that they may see the wisdom in developing these strategies, that they will promote the implementation of a new development model that would include food security for the nation as a priority. The church as a leader of the communities in Barbados must therefore not only be guardians of the value of the society, but the church should provide for the economic progress of its members, and thus must give hope and build a foundation for a brighter tomorrow. The church must continue to protect the weak from the strong and the just from the unjust. The church must ensure that when we sing, O oh, sweet and blessed country, the home of God's elect, O oh, sweet and blessed country that eager hearts expect, Jesus, you in mercy brings us to that dear land of rest, who art with God the Father and Spirit ever blessed. Those who leave for the great beyond would have lived a life that was fulfilled, a life of dignity, a life of social justice, and a life of respect. May the church lead, using the example of the feeding of the 5,000 on the western side of the River Jordan, which flows into the Sea of Galilee, as reported in Matthew 14, 13 to 21, and invest in feeding the 2,000 and 80,000 of Barbados. <laughs> These are difficult economic times, not only for small developing countries, but for the developed ones as well. We are in the grip of a new dimension in world development in which the line of demarcation between the developed and the developing is becoming less pronounced. And the individual, the entrepreneur, the private sector will play an increasingly important role in our world. A famous writer once said, to plan for tomorrow is not to determine what we are going to do tomorrow, but to determine what we must do today so that we will have a tomorrow. We must rise to the challenges of our time and work hard for a brighter tomorrow. As we have overcome the difficulties of the past, so too will we conquer the dangers of the present and will emerge a stronger people, better prepared to take our rightful place on the regional and world stage, confident that the vision of our forefathers have been fulfilled. We must all work together to open windows of opportunity and to provide rays of hope for the children of the future so that they can take their rightful place on the world stage and look the horizons be beyond those to which they were born so that they may dream dreams of greatness and have the tools to achieve their aspirations. I hope that we and the church working together can contribute and assist and producing, in producing the men and women of the 21st century who will be responsible for the continued progress of this nation. Let me end this brief address <laughs> by saying that as we look to the future, 
Let us remember the contribution and the work of Sarah Ann Gill and the words of that great apostle of peace and brotherhood, Mahatma Gandhi, who reminded us in lessons in leadership that unless we take care, seven things will destroy us. Wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, worship without sacrifice, science without humanity, and politics without principles. The measure of our success as a nation will not be the number of cars per capita or how many cell phones we have in this country. The measure of our success as a nation will be whether we have built a society where there is social justice, where all our citizens can participate in the benefits of development, and where long-lasting institutional arrangements have been made to provide for social justice, security, health, education, energy, water, and food for the nation. And finally, in the words of our national anthem, we loyal sons and daughters all do hereby make it known that these fields and hills beyond recall are now our very own. Upward and onward we shall go, inspired, exultant, free, and grow greater will our nation grow in strength and unity. Let us continue to work together with the church and the communities they serve, with the government and with the people, and with all our institutions, to make this a place of peace and tranquility and social justice for all. Let us return to our religious foundation, recognizing that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. I thank you for your patience.